Thank you. Uh, also from my side, a warm welcome here at HITS, and I'm, I'm glad you're interested in, in some of the stars. And today I will talk about the latest news from the inside of the stars, but I thought you may not always look at the stars outside, so I thought to start a little bit with the outside of the stars, just as a beginning. So what can we do? Well, we can look at stars. Just use your own eyes, that's actually pretty nice. You can do this at, at night if you're in a dark place, I can really recommend it, it's magical. But it doesn't tell us all that much. So we don't typically only observe with our eyes, but we use telescopes. And one of the main famous telescopes is the Hubble telescope. And if Hubble looks for us, then it's something like this. So it's just looking at the sky. And I think there is quite a few things that you can immediately see from here. And the one thing is that not all stars have the same color. So you have the blue, white ones here, but here you can also see red ones and so on. So stars come in different colors. And then the second thing that you see is that the stars are not all lo looking equally bright. So there's some very bright ones here. There's also some very dim ones there. So these are already observations from the outside of the star that we can easily make and are quite understandable. And we can learn something from that. So the first thing we can learn is that if we look at the color, we can learn something about the temperature on the surface of the star. Because if we look at hot stars, they are very blue, blue whitish. They're hot. They're tens of thousands of kelvins. And kelvin is roughly the same as centigrades. So you can compare it with that. And if we look at more the yellow and the red stars, we will hear more at the cool end. So this is only 5,000 kelvin. So our sun, as a reference, is more here in the red, yellowish and is 5,777 kelvin, to be precise. But say, nearly 6,000 Kelvin, so 6,000 degrees. So that is what we can already see from the color of a star. So even though I'm talking about the latest news from inside the stars, there's already news on the outside of the star. We can see what kind of, of temperature it is. And then I said that we can see the different brightnesses. And this is a little bit with your, if you walk in the st on the street in the dark and there's a car coming, and you can see the headlights of the car, and the headlights get brighter when the car approaches you. That's not because the headlights change. No, the distance between you and the headlights is changing. And so what we see here to learn something about the real amount of light that a star is emitting, we have to include the distance. Because maybe one of those faint stars here is actually one of the brightest, but it is so far away that we, can't, we see it only very dim. And this here, this very bright one here, must not be the most bright star, but it could be the closest. So it's very important if we want to know what kind of energy is radiated by the star, that we know the distance. And we can measure the distance. You and I do this every day, continuously. So we have two eyes, and we have our nose in the middle. And because this eye sees the world from a slightly different point of view than this eye does, that is why you see depth. And so we can do this as well in astronomy because we, have, we are fortunate that the Earth is turning around the Sun. So we can take a measurement at a certain time on one side of the Sun and look at the picture of this really bright star and we can compare it to stars that are even further away and they are kind of so far that we can't see them move. And then half a year later, when the Earth is there, we can see and we can view it from a slightly different standpoint. And so again, like with our eyes, we can see the distance, so you have what's called parallax measurement, this angle is the difference in how you look at it. So we can actually measure um, the distance of the star, and so we have this brightness, and we have the distance, and from that together, we can get what we call the luminosity, and that is essentially the energy radiated by a star. And that's again, it's very important news from a star, because we need to know, if we want to understand what star it is and what's happening, we need to know what kind of energy it's radiating. So this is already from the outside of the star that we can, uh, we can measure. And then there's one more thing, if I take this picture, I've now taken this picture once, but I can wait a little bit and take the picture again. And now what we see is that the stars have moved a little bit. So there's a movement on the sky, and we call this proper motion, and so we can see how the stars are moving in the plane of the sky. So even by just looking at it, although it is not with our naked eyes, but with a telescope, we can already learn a lot about the stars. And this is just in kind of integrated light, so we take all the light that we can get at once. 
But what we can also do, and we can do this, for instance, with a prism, you can separate out the light. So the white light, and you know this from a rainbow, for instance, there is essentially the white sunlight is coming onto a raindrop, and the raindrop splits it in all the different colors, and that makes a rainbow. Well, we can do that here too, and you can see the kind of schematic rainbow that we have here. This is a prism, the raindrop for a, a rainbow, and you see all the colors. And we can see what happens in those colors. And I give you two examples. So you have, again, the colors here. So that's the, the wavelength is the more technical term for it. And we have some um, flux, so amount of energy that's coming towards us. And we can measure that. And this is for two different stars. And you can see that the shape is different. So again, we, we can measure things here. And the two most obvious things are the peak wavelength. So this one has the highest point, like here in the violet or something like that. Well, this one has it much more into the blue cyan colors. So that's different already. So we know some differences between stars. And the other thing is what you see here is what we call absorption lines. So you have these dips here. So essentially, there is something in the star that takes some of the energy away at that particular wavelength. And so that tells us a little bit about the chemistry. So these are the things that we can learn. So these peak wavelengths. Here is correlated with the surface temperature, so this one is much hotter than that star. This is similar to what we can do with, our, with just looking at the light, but it is good to have two measurements, because essentially they should be the same, so we can kind of check if everything is okay. And then from these absorption lines, and I have a schematic here, we can learn something about the, the surface chemical composition. So again, when we look at that, we know roughly these are all hydrogen lines, so we know hydrogen, but by the depth of it, that correlates with how much there is. So we know how much hydrogen in this case, but there's also, and certainly in this star, other elements present. And now if a star rotates, stars often rotate, they don't stand still, they, they rotate around, and if they rotate, these lines, this absorption line, will become wider. And so the width of this line tells us something about the rotation of the star. And then the last thing is that this line, we know where the element is, that's at the fixed position, but the line actually may move and may not be at that fixed position. And that is because the star is moving away or towards us. So we already had the movement on the sky, but we can also see the star moving away and towards us. So again, these are measurements that we can just to, to recap here. We can already from the outside of the star get a lot of information about the star. So we can get the surface temperature, something about the surface chemical composition, we can get the movement on the sky, we can get its rotation. However, that does not tell us all. Because we can, when we do the computations of a star, which we can do, we can put in several mechanisms, and I indicated them here with different factories. We can put in di different factories, while we get exactly the same on the outside of the star. And so we need, if we really want to understand the stars, we need to go into the stars and we need to also have a look what's happening there. And that is indeed, Peter said it correctly, asteroseismology. So this term comes from aster, that's in Greek, that's a star. Seismology, we all know this, when it's an earthquake, we do seismology also on the earth. And the logi is from logic. So what we try to do in asteroseismology, we try to follow the logic if we have a quake, or we call it often oscillations, and we try to follow that, and then it essentially probes through the opaque layer of the star, and we get the information out. This may sound a bit abstract, but you can kind of think of it as listening to different music instruments. So we can do that. So here we have a clarinet, and if I now play one tone with the clarinet, that sounds like this. And now I take another instrument and I play the same tone. In this case, I have a trumpet. And you all heard, I hope, that they, those sounds are different. So they're the same tones, but they're different sounds. And that's because they're played with different instruments. So the instruments have a different shape. So as soon as we blow air into these the instruments, the, 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 the air that's already there starts to vibrate, starts to resonate into a, what we call a cavity, so that's the shape of the instrument. And that produces, because that is different, it produces different sounds. And therefore we hear a clarinet and a trumpet, we hear differently. And if we would add other instruments, of course, we hear them differently too. And so we do now a similar thing with stars. 
So what we do, we can obviously, we can't listen. In space, you can't listen. There is no air for the sound waves to propagate, but we can see. So what we have here is a star, and then we have a telescope, and I brought the telescope here as well. So I'll just pick it up without breaking it. So this is the Kepler space mission. This is launched in 2006 by the, the NASA Space Agency, and it was actually, when it was launched, it was focused on detecting exoplanets. And it found loads and loads of them. But as a side effect, we could also, because we measure stars here, like every minute or every half hour, we measure how bright the star is, we actually found even many, many more stars that oscillate. And that looks a little bit like this. So what you see here is measurements taken of a star every single half hour. And I only show you here 20 days, and that is because otherwise you wouldn't see anything anymore, because it's so packed. But we have done this for four years. So this Kepler mission has been active for four years and looked at the filter view in the Lyra constellation, which is as big as if you put your hand on the sky. That's about the size of what, what it looked at. For four years, observing 200 to 250,000 stars. And so it found among the stars, as I said, many planets. That was the purpose. But much more oscillating stars. And so therefore, um, that, that I find that very interesting. And what I wanted to do now first, before I give you some real insights that we gained from those observations, what we did is we translated this light into something that you can hear. And so I would like you to hear now some of the stars. Um, and the first star is the sun. So that is our sun. I, I can play it again. It came a bit unexpected, I think. Um, so this is the sun. So we can do this. is not the field of astroseismology. It's the field of helioseismology. But we did there exactly the same. And so we observed the sun has an oscillation period of about five minutes. So we observed that. And now we just translated it to something that you can hear. I'll play it again. And so this is the sun. And now we can also, as I said, it had different instrument. I showed you a clarinet and I showed you a trumpet. We can now also go to a slightly different star. So there's a very famous set of stars, that's 16 sig A and 16 sig B. Those stars are going around each other. It's called the binary. And the 16 sig A is slightly, has a slightly higher mass than the sun. And 16 sig B is slightly lower mass. So we first listen to 16 sig A. And I guess it's clear, this is different. It's hard to justify or, or to, to quantify how different, but this sounds different. And now if we go to a star that has a slightly lower mass than our sun, that's 16 sig b. Again, it sounds different. And this is essentially what we use, although we never, for research, do it in the audible regime. But this is what we use to study these stars and study the differences in the stars. And these stars, and you saw it here on the, on the figure, which I didn't explain and I will do now, you see the surface temperature, which I introduced already. We get this from the color. That's why colors are displayed here, too. And this luminosity, so the amount of energy that is radiated by the star. And the stars here on this line here, this vertical line, is what we call main sequence. Those are actually the stars in their, their kind of core lifetime. They fuse hydrogen to helium in their cores. And this is also where the sun is. This is a relatively long part of their lives, say 80, 90% of their lives, stars spent here, burning, fusing their hydrogen. And so these two stars, three stars that I, that I sh well, showed you, but then in hearing, how do you say this, um, are all there. But then at some point, the hydrogen is depleted in, in the core. And so the star have to do, has to do something else. And it continues burning hydrogen in a shell around the helium core. And that is what we call a giant. That's here. And I'm oh, there. It's the giants. And those are my pet stars. Everybody has their own pet stars. Everybody has his own pets. I have giants as my pets, the red giants. Um, and I also, therefore, want to have you listen to one of the red giants. I 
there's actually some people have made real music with this and use this as an undertone. I, I do really like it. I mean, I don't not only like the stars, but also their music. So this is again, uh, it is a red giant. And this is also, I want to focus on these type of stars to tell you the news about. Because as you see here, we have many different stars. They, they, they are here, they're there. So we can't study all stars at the same time. They have very different properties. Like human beings have all very different properties. So this is the type of stars that I focus on. And I will give you some insight about. So the first thing that we can do is actually, we can do very basic measurements. But if you think of it, knowing how large a star is in space, that is not so easy. I mean, you can't go there and take your ruler. And I, I drew a ruler here now, um, but that's just to illustrate it. But this is one of the things that we can do. We can use these oscillations that you can schematically see here. They, they move through the star. And if a star is, is bigger, it takes longer to move through. And so we can measure that. And so we can actually measure how large a star is. And just think about it. What other measurements would we have to just measure how large a star is? I mean, it's not many. So this is one of the few methods that can actually do this. And I, I put scales because we can also weigh a star. How massive is a star? Again, we can't go there and measure it. But with these, these um, waves that we have, Depending on the medium, medium, the waves move a little bit faster or, or, or are slower, and that gives us a measure also of the mass, or so the mass combined with the radius. So we can actually, with astroseismology, we can get the mass and radius of a star. This is not something we could see from the outside. We don't have a measure like the color or the brightness that we, from the outside, can get a measure of the mass and the radius. But now we can. There are some different methods, I have to say this in this audience as well, but uh, like if they move around each other, we can also measure this, but that's not all stars do that. So for a single star with oscillations, we can now measure the mass and radius. And then you may think, so what? Are we actually interested? Well, I'm personally interested, but there's also other fields that are interested. And just name one field, that's the exoplanet field. And I already mentioned exoplanets because we measure them at the, with the same telescope. But we actually, if we detect, we, we find exoplanets, we don't see the exoplanets. We see the star and we see from the star that there is an exoplanet. So we don't observe this picture. This is totally surreal. We don't know what it looks like. So what we, but, but we see what the star has a slightly different behavior. And from this behavior, if we, we can also infer the, 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 the size, the mass, the radius, etc., from the planet, so the planet properties. And so we can only do this if we know the stellar properties. So if we know the mass of the star and the radius of the star, we can use that to get the mass and the radius of the planet. And this is what many people want because they're looking for a second Earth. And Earth is not so heavy, so Earth is very hard to detect. Um, but this is the way to it, because without these measurements from inside the star, getting the mass and the radius, we can't get mass and the radius of the planets. So this is one of the, one of the things where astroseismology is really important and where we really need this, this information from inside the star. Another thing that we really are interested in, I already alluded at the rotation. If a star rotates, we can see the surface move. But actually, how does it rotate? Does the core move at the same speed, very deep inside the star, or not? So in the red giants, we get really information from very deep into the star, and we can actually measure if the star, if the core is rotating at the same speed as the surface. And I have a small movie to show you that. So here we have the sun on the left-hand side. So you see the sun rotate, there's some sunspots on it. And next to it, you see the red giant. And the red giant is rotating much slower. And that you know if you go on this, this, this moving thing, if you go white and you see the, the ballet uh, or the ice dancer, people do it. If they move their arms in and out, it goes faster and smaller. And now we were able to measure also the core. And what you see here, the core rotates much faster than the surface, about 10 times faster. And so we have been able to measure that. So we probed inside the star, and we can get now the measurement of the core. And it's even more interesting, if we then do predictions, the, the, the core rotates much, much slower. So, so we even don't understand this. So, if we, so we, we, first of all, we can look into the star, and then we find a big discrepancy with our models. So we know some physics is missing. And this is essentially what we do and what we try to do 
with this field, of, field that I'm in, we try to measure things and then see if our models work. We say, no, the model doesn't work. That's most of the time. And then we go back and say, what do we have? What other ingredients do we need to put in to make it work and to understand better what it is? So what I've tried to convey here, and I'm very open to have questions also uh, after this, is that we need essentially all these different types of measurements to really understand the star. So it's not only looking at it, it's not only the splitted light, but we also need this, this information from inside the star, which we can get in this way by doing astroseismology. So thank you very much for your attention, and please, if you have questions, I'm very happy to answer. Them. <laughs>